Welcome to another episode of the Battlefields and Bourbon Podcast, the podcast where we sit and sip, talk all things Civil War history and bourbon and whiskey. I'm Jack, joined as always by my co-host Elijah. Today we are coming to you from the historic Bell House in beautiful downtown Winchester, Virginia. The Bell House is preserved and maintained by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation, the managing entity of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, consider becoming a member of the Battlefields Foundation. They're the official sponsor of the podcast, so every dollar you give to support Battlefield Preservation in turn helps support the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast. You can head on over to www.shenandoahatwar.org, click on Ways to Give, click on Membership. Membership starts as low as $35 and go till you can't give no more. So if you like what you're listening to, we highly encourage you to become a member of the Battlefields Foundation. Elijah. Jack. We're back at it. Again. Again, we got a guest in the room, reoccurring guest now, Michael Gianfrido, lovely, lovely historian, now christening his knowledge to the room. Just a fine young man. Yeah, just a fine young man. We're having him back on. If you haven't checked out Michael's other episode, he covered the 11th Mississippi, specifically Company A, the University Gray. So go over and check that out. Uh, but Elijah, our glasses are empty. Tell us what we're sipping on today. This is going to be Penelope Architects straight bourbon whiskey finished with French oak staves. So we had Penelope's uh, flagship product in a previous episode. Uh, so this is that, I believe. Well, no, that was a four grain. So mm-hmm. this is uh, 75% corn, 21% rye, 4% malted barley. Uh, it is 100, 104 proof, um, so a little bit of a jump from that 80 proof uh, from their flagship four grain. Uh, and this is, like I said, finished with French oak staves, so it should change the flavor profile a little bit there. Uh, aged four years, and uh, on the website it says there are number four staves, as far as the char, number four char, so that's like an alligator heavy char, um, and number two char barrel heads, so that'll kind of switch up the flavor profile there a little bit, but we can pop this one. and Good pop. They're always good. Penelope yeah. always does a good, good bottle, good cork. This was a gift to me which was in turn then a gift to the podcast uh from good friend chris g listener i think hopefully and uh but good bottle he's he's the one that gifted us the other bottle of penelope it's always a good one to have on the show i really enjoyed the first one that we had so hopefully this one is a a step up i've also had uh, penelope's barrel strength obviously not on an episode at least none that we've heard yet but uh each product that I've had from them has been impressive. You definitely get that same sweetness, the vanilla, uh, that kind of caramel uh, nose on it, kind of... Real light. Yeah, yeah. It's typical of their products, it seems. It's very light but sweet. Any thoughts on the nose, Michael? It smells good. There you go. <laughs> All right, giving it a taste. I know what that tastes like, but I can't say exactly what it is. It's something very familiar... But uh, also very light on the on the on the yeah, palate as well. Yeah, it's light, caramely, and it's got that vanilla to it. I mean, of course, from your French oak, but that one hundred and four proof just sits really well. It's not it's not overbearing by any yeah, means. But it's enough heat to remind yeah. you, hey, this is alcohol. Yeah, Ready warm the on the way down. Opinion. Yeah, it tastes good. There you go. Good. <laughs> yeah, see. On their website, if you're looking at like any of the tasting notes, uh, nosing, anything like that, they say that the aroma is sweet candied cream and floral with hints of creme brulee. I think that's what it is that I was thinking. It was like a creme brulee, maybe like a, like one of those vanilla bean ice creams. Yeah. Um, forward notes, it says sweet vanilla and viscous cream, savory oak notes. I think the cream is like the... I think it's the, the, the creme brulee definitely is that caramel, like gives you that caramel type flavor. And then you're also getting that vanilla yeah. you know, sweetness coming through. Yeah. The body on it, it says creamy sweetness transitions from the forward notes and into the body, herbal, floral, and cream. So cream, I think, is the, uh, is the common this, denominator uh, here of this uh, whiskey, which it, you definitely pick up on that. It, like I said, kind of tastes like a vanilla bean ice cream, which I mean is enjoyable, but... With that heat to it too, that's that's something that would that would really blend well. But I'm impressed with it. I think it's I think it's another good product from Penelope and one that hopefully we can get our listeners to try as well. Yeah, oh, it's really really good. I like it. I like the heat that's specifically this time of year. Yeah, it yeah, being no. a little good, bit well. Hopefully suit. cold. Yeah, hopefully it's getting colder. The weather's been very bipolar here. Recently. I don't know what it's doing. It's definitely been feeling cold up in Cumberland, Maryland. Oh, there recently. you go. Yeah. 
Well, as we've got our glasses semi full now, French we've all had oak and bayous. Oh, what kind of bayous? Yeah, what are we talking about? Bayous, yeah. <laughs> well, just hit, what's the topic we're talking about today, Michael? So we'll be talking about the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, which takes place in late December of 1862. There's a few reasons why I really wanted to cover this battle today. Uh, it's a really important, sometimes overlooked engagement. Uh, it's important because this is the first Union thrust towards the city of Vicksburg. It's also going to be the first independent command of a general by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman. I'm sure you guys have heard of him before. This is also a big reason why, and I might be spoiling the episode here, big reason why 1862 ends in Confederate victory. It happens all across uh, uh, the South in Virginia and Tennessee and Mississippi, and this is one of those uh, three right there. And then on top of that, I had a fourth great-grandfather, uh, Jean Thielen Landry, who uh, fought in Company E, the Grievault City Guards of the 26th Louisiana Infantry at the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. The 26th Louisiana was probably one of the most heavily engaged units at that, in at that battle, so definitely a, a, a something that has drawn me to want to study the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou more than some of the other ones in the Mississippi Theater. How long have you been studying this battle for and what really got you into it at first? Uh, well, like I said, it was because I had a, a direct ancestor who fought in that engagement. Um, the only other major battle that the 26th Louisiana takes part in or campaign is going to be the Siege of Vicksburg itself. Mm -hmm. And for me, this was a battlefield that was, I mean, it's a skip hop and a jump away from the Vicksburg National Military Park. In mm -hmm. fact, from some parts of Vicksburg National Military Park, particularly the Fort Hill tour stop, if you're looking out north from Fort Hill, you're seeing the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield. You can see the actual Chickasaw Bayou run in the distance. Mm -hmm. So it's right there next to the Net Vicksburg National Military Park. But even up until today, there has not been any interpretation on the site. The only thing that they have is a state highway marker, which is two sentences, three sentences at most. Um, and then uh, recently, the American Battlefield Trust have had efforts to preserve parcels of land at Chickasaw Bayou. Uh, and I haven't been back there since any of them have been opened up to the general public. Mm -hmm. Last time I was there was probably a little under a year and a half ago, and they had the preserved forever signs up. We just haven't seen the actual non-historic structures demolished and interpretation put in there. But the place that they have preserved is a perfect location to add that interpretation for cool. that site. It's right in the middle of an area that was referred to as the Bloody Triangle. And we'll talk a little bit about that during the podcast here. Yeah. And what was that like, I guess, right off the bat? You said, you know, researching this and then visiting the site, you're saying that there's not a whole lot of interpretation there, period. Was that daunting to go out there? <clears throat> it was daunting, but part of it was, it was cool because it was a, it was a kind of an open slate. Yeah. Um, I talked, uh, I was in correspondence with Terrence Winchell, who was a long-term historian from the Vicksburg National Military Park. Uh, I've read a number of texts from, or about, the, the, the campaigns itself, the Central Mississippi Railroad campaign, the movements towards Vicksburg, and then towards the end of uh, my school, and I went to, if you listened to, my la to the last episode that I was on, you know, that I was an uh, alumni at the University of Mississippi, and my last year that I was there, I did a, uh, a study on the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, I ended up writing, uh, doing a video on it, which became my first video that I have on YouTube, so if you go into my YouTube account, Frito History, the first video is about a 30-minute long I say documentary tour of the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield, but I will give people a heads up. It was my first video, so really poor <laughs> editing. Um, but if you want to see any of the battlefield locations that we're talking about today, I show you the majority of them in that video. So definitely worth it to jump on there. And if you're ever visiting the Vicksburg National Military Park, any of our listeners, definitely make it a stop to go see Chickasaw Bayou. It's less than 10 minutes from the actual military park itself. And this is a really important, often forgotten or overlooked part of the movements towards Vicksburg. It's almost oh. completely intact, too. I mean, it's just open fields for the most yeah, part. Yeah, there's a, some parts of it that have been minorly developed over, mm -hmm. but I mean, take that, you know, compared to the development that's been happening here in Virginia over some of these yeah. battlefields, yeah, it's, it's a wide sum of that battlefield is still undeveloped or is open, at least, to interpretation. And that's, that's why I kind of asked you that question is because not too often in the, the age we're living in as historians do we get to go out <clears throat> and be the first to kind of study that ground. You know, it was back in the 80s and the 90s or, or even at the turn of the, you know, uh, 19th to the 20th century of historians going out to these landscapes unpreserved but undeveloped and, and taking the information that they have and kind of 
looking at the landscape and letting it talk to the to the research they've done. Um, yeah, I, w- I will say I was not the first person to go ahead and study that battlefield. Oh, yeah. Maybe the first person who uh, made an in- in-depth video yeah. at all the at the major movements of the of the battle on YouTube. Even that, I'm not the only one, but well, it's something it, it I'm like cool. envious of to be yeah. able to research in depth the battle and then go tour it with on unpreserved but intact land and and not super accessible, not open to the public you're painting the picture in your head from based off your research or something we all take for granted today, being able to go to already preserved lands and parks that, you know, that is something like I'd crave. Cause it's almost like you're treasure hunting. Cause yeah. like you said, people have researched it before people have written about it, but to be able to go out there and take what you've learned already and then let the land almost talk to you without other influence, whether it be an interpretive sign or an audio tour stop, uh, something I'm sure that was really yeah. cool. And Elijah mentioned, I mean, a lot of those battlefield locations are still in great condition. From yeah. There is a Native American mound on the battlefield that was a major location. We'll talk about that here in this podcast. But like that still survives. A lot of the battlefield locations are still there. The Vicksburg racetrack is still right there on the side of the battlefield. So it's still there. It's just waiting for people yeah. to go there and to appreciate it. That's and cool. I will say the the when I was there at least, I ran into a number of the locals who actually lived on the property where parts of the battle happened at, and they were all super super engaging. They were really excited to see people out there actually wanting to study what happened on the land that they live at. Now. That's cool. And Elijah, cool. you said you've been there before, correct? Yep. Uh, we actually went out there um, on a trip to Vicksburg to do some metal detecting and just you know tour the area. And uh, we were invited out to a par- uh, parcel out there at the Chickasaw Bayou, part of the battlefield, uh, by a property owner. He said he had found some artillery shells on his property and, sa- and just said we were wow. welcome to check it out. So, That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's like pre... You, everybody nowadays just expects everything's either protected or preserved or lost. Mm-hmm. So the idea that the stuff's living in some sort of purgatory... It's like almost or, completely private property yeah. as far as I'm aware, yeah. Yeah, and it's... Yeah, we take it for granted being where we are in this region of the country and its Civil War history. So I think that's super cool that, you know, there's potential out there at that site. It's just got to, you know, get done. And for something that's so often overlooked, too. I mean, it's something that that the archaeological record for something like this, that's the the battle itself is not very well mapped. The archaeological record will help you do just that as far as, you know, finding your battle lines and all of that stuff. I mean, that, that plays a huge role in it. Yeah. Well, I guess let's stop talking about it and talk about it. <laughs> talk so, about it. Yeah. So, so how do we how do we get here? How do we get to you know the, this area of of the country in 1862? Well, to talk about the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, you first have to talk about the city of Vicksburg during the Civil War, and Vicksburg's important for a number of reasons. The city itself is situated on these high bluffs that overlook the Mississippi River, and it kind of juts out into the river. So, for going, you know. Big picture here, the Union uh, uh, war effort at the beginning of the, of the war is going to be the Anaconda plan. They're going to try to take all the ports for the Confederacy, and that's going to include part of that Anaconda stake going into the Mississippi River and taking down the Mississippi River. You see, the Mississippi River is, is a super highway for the country, and it effectively kind of spits, splits the Confederacy into two. So the, the Union can take all these ports on the Mississippi River, but as long as Vicksburg is standing— that is a position where the Confederates can, you know, rain hell upon the Union gunboats as they move up and down the Mississippi. So it's important for that. It's also important, and, and because of that, it's get referred, or it receives the nickname the Gibraltar of the Confederacy. So wow. pretty, you know, high praise right there. Yeah. And then on top of that, Vicksburg has a number of rail lines, one of which goes from east-west, and it takes a lot of the goods that are coming from the states west of the Mississippi, so like Texas and Louisiana, taking goods from out there, and it's transporting it through Vicksburg east to go supply the main armies of the Confederacy. So it's important for that reason as well. Um, And just to highlight the importance of the city of Vicksburg, here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln right in the beginning of the war. He says, quote, See what a lot of land these fellows hold, of which Vicksburg is the key. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. We could take all the northern ports of the Confederacy, and they can defy us from Vicksburg. Hmm. And that's from President Lincoln himself. Wow. So it's on the, the, the Union High Command's mind early on in this war. Now, for the Confederate perspective, 1862 is not a good year in the state of Mississippi. Um, 
And it's really going to start off uh, in the first part of the year, operations on the Mississippi and the Tennessee rivers, uh, the fall of Fort Donelson, uh, Fort Henry. And then in April, April 6th and 7th of 1862, the Battle of Shiloh is fought. It's a Tennessee battlefield, but it's right there on the Tennessee uh, north, uh, northeast Mississippi border. And once the, uh, uh, the Battle of Shiloh is fought, that really opens up the state of Mississippi and the Mississippi Valley for a federal invasion. Now, later that month, uh, just a few weeks later on April 25th, 1862, the city of New Orleans falls. So that's one of the first major port cities in the Confederacy to fall. And that's south of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River. Um, just a, uh, about a month later, the Siege of Vicksburg is fought, another Union victory. And then on June 6, 1862, while Stonewall Jackson out here in Virginia is ra- wrapping up his Valley Campaign, the city of Memphis falls, which is, if you look at the Mississippi River, you have New Orleans, which is kind of towards the, 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 uh, the bottom, towards the southern end. Memphis is right north of the state of Mississippi on the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. So once Memphis falls, you kind of have this one little pocket in the middle, which is where Vicksburg is, that the Union need to take. So that happens, and after Memphis Falls, the only major strongholds on the Mississippi River that the Confederates hold are going to be Vicksburg and Port Hudson. Uh, Just a few months after that, at the Battle of Iuka is fought on September 19th, 1862. That's another Union victory. And then on October 3rd and 4th, 1862, the Second Battle of Corinth is fought, another Union victory. So... It's a string of these Union victories that are bringing the Federals closer and deeper into the Mississippi region itself. And remember, the whole goal of this invasion into Mississippi is to gain the city of Vicksburg. Remember, Vicksburg is the key. Even going until today, that's like part of their tourism advertisements is the key city, Vicksburg. Mm. So uh, so after uh, uh, the Battle of Corinth in, in, in October of 1862, Grant is going to launch a campaign. That's going to happen in November and December of 1862. It's going to be referred to as the Central Mississippi Railroad Campaign. And in short, Grant is going to try and drive south using the Central Mississippi Railroad into the state of Mississippi. And the railroad effectively splits the state into a eastern and western half. He'll drive into the state from the railroad and then try to take Vicksburg from the land. The Central Mississippi Railroad, it was a Pretty new line. It was put uh, up in eight. It was finalized in 1860, or 1852, so just about 10 years before this campaign. And then in 1860, the first rail link between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico will happen on the part of the Central Mississippi mm. Railroad. So pretty important line even just for American history right there. So he's moving north to south. Yes. Yeah, so and he'll, then west. He'll, lo- he'll uh, leave Memphis, and then he'll move east to Grand, Grand Junction, Tennessee, from Grand Junction, Tennessee, he'll turn south and will drive south using the Central Mississippi Railroad. Okay. Now, before I talk more about the campaign or even getting into the battle itself, um, I want to kind of paint a picture of what the state of Mississippi looks like, how these movements are happening. So for anybody who's listening to this in the car, picture the state of Mississippi. Uh, if you have uh, access to a phone or a computer, find an uh, image online. But Vicksburg is going to be on the eastern side of the state, right where the uh, uh, the border is on the Mississippi River. Western? Or, yeah, western. My apologies. Very my good. apologies. <laughs> now, just north of the city of Vicksburg, the Yazoo River will fork off from the Mississippi, and it's going to head north in a or in a northeast direction. Uh, there's a number of waterways that kind of spur off of the Yazoo River. The first of which is going to be the Chickasaw Bayou. So the Chickasaw Bayou spurs off of the Yazoo basically right after it forks off of the Mississippi. And I'll get back to that region in a minute. But if you follow the Yazoo River north, or that northeast direction, you'll have three lateral running rivers that will spur off from the Yazoo River. And they're going to run in a west to east direction. The southernmost of these, uh, uh, or, of, or actually I'll do it, the northernmost of these uh, rivers is the Coldwater River. It is going to be positioned just north of the city of Holly Springs, uh, which is on the Central Mississippi Railroad. And then the middle of these rivers is going to be the Tallahatchie River. That's the same Tallahatchie River that uh, the Ode to Billy Joe McAllister is about. And that's just north of the city of Oxford, Mississippi, and the campus of the University of Mississippi. And then nor- or, and then just south of that is going to be the Yalabusha River, which it, uh, runs north of the city of Grenada. So... As Grant is starting to drive south, he's going to have to take each of these river crossings, and they're going to be pretty hotly contested. So 
He'll move south, he'll take the Coldwater River, and then Grant will set up a supply depot in Holly Springs, just in between the Coldwater River and the Tallahatchie River. Keep that in mind, that he has this supply depot in Holly Springs. And Grant will continue driving south. He'll reach the Tallahatchie River, and staring right down at him is uh, uh, Pemberton's entire Confederate army. So for the Confederate forces in Mississippi, the, the, the Department of Mississippi in East Louisiana is under the command of General Pemberton, but you also have a garrison that still is in Vicksburg under the command of General Mor uh, uh, Martin Luther Smith. So Vicksburg's not just kind of being left high and dry as these operations are happening in yeah. the middle of the state. But um, as Grant approaches the Tallahatchie River, he reaches what is referred to as the Tallahatchie Line. Just south of the Tallahatchie, the Confederates have set up a really complex line of entrenchments, lunettes, and eventually in early December 1862, Grant's going to start sending his men to the east and the west to try and outflank this line. And that's going to force Pemberton to fall back south through the city of Oxford, Mississippi. There's actually a small skirmish that is fought in the city of Oxford. One of the main Confederate battle lines is Jackson Avenue, where it runs through the square, if anybody from Oxford is listening to this. And then uh, after that little action in Oxford, Pemberton's going to fall all the way back south of the Yalabusha River, and he is going to position himself in Fort Pemberton, which is just north of the city of Grenada. So after Pemberton falls back from the Tallahatchie line back to Fort Pemberton in Grenada, uh, Grant is going to move south, and he is going to occupy the city of Oxford, Mississippi. And he'll occupy that town with roughly 80,000 federal troops. And I mention this because if you're a college football fan, you know the University of Mississippi is right there in Oxford. The, camp, or the stadium holds just about 70,000, so the, camp, uh, the tailgating grounds probably have 80, maybe 85, 90,000 people in there on a given big weekend. So the federal army was about 80,000 men. They're camped out right on the square and on the campus of the University of Mississippi. When you walk through that campus on a game day and you see all those tents there and that sea of people, you could kind of imagine it, that being the massive influx of federal soldiers who just ended up right there on that Ole Miss campus. So was this, is there, is there any accounts from the university themselves or is this the first time federals are this deep or this is, this the, is the first, first time, time they've seen federals? This is the first time that Oxford, Mississippi is under a major federal occupation. And throughout the war, Oxford isn't, it's occupied, it's not, it doesn't really become a major hub or anything. Like in summer of 1864, Nathan Bedford Forrest will loosely use the campus as his, uh, as his headquarters. Um, but that's going to be the biggest occupation of that city during the Civil War. I can war. imagine, it's a lot. And then towards the end of the war, uh, right after a, uh, a small battle called the Battle of Hurricane Creek, uh, and that's when Forrest is headquartered on the campus, Andrew Jackson Whiskey Smith, which that ties into our podcast here, um, <laughs> He is actually in retaliation for this movement because Forrest moves around and he'll burn Memphis. Smith is going to burn the city of Oxford, or is going to burn the square in Oxford, Mississippi. So there is one pre-war or wartime picture of the square with reportedly federal troops camped out in front of it. But they burnt that square down, and then they were supposed to burn down portions of the campus, but that didn't happen because the unit that was sent out there was a Minnesota unit, only found apparatuses of you know medical purposes or teaching purposes. That's a whole other story for 1864. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, in, in 1862, this is going to be the largest occupation of the city of Oxford during the war, which it's a pretty big city in the state. And um, so at this point, you have Grant in Oxford with about 80,000 men. Pemberton is at Fort Pemberton, which is just south of the Yalabush River in Grenada. And then you have Martin Luther Smith, which has a small garrison out in Vicksburg. Now, Grant at this moment, he's going to reassess the movements. And he's actually going to send William T. Sherman back to Memphis, Tennessee. And he's going to send him back with roughly 30,000 troops. And at this point, uh, Sherman's going to then sail down the Mississippi River. He will land, or then move up the Yazoo River, land at the Chickasaw Bayou, and will try to drive in north of the city of Vicksburg so that this becomes kind of a two-prong invasion, with Sherman taking Vicksburg from the river, Grant taking Vicksburg from the land. Now, as Grant is sending Sherman back to Memphis and all this is happening, Pemberton isn't just sitting by idly. He's actually going to send uh, Earl Van Dorn and Nathan Bedford Forrest, two cavalry uh, officers. They're gonna, he's going to send them on a raid. Forrest is going to raid western Tennessee, and Earl Van Dorn is going to basically sidestep around Grant's men in Oxford, and he is going to raid the federal uh, um, 
depot at Holly Springs. So once they raid Holly Springs, the Confederate cavalrymen, they're going to put on all the stuff that they can carry with them, everything that they can't carry. They're going to put into baggage trains, light those on fire. There are reports that the buildings were actually blown off of their foundations during this. And if you go sit, visit the city of Holly Springs, there's a lot of great interpretation out there regarding this raid. But that is going to free up Pemberton. Is this is this the time when um, the like the Battle of Parker's Crossroads takes place, or is that um, a little bit after this? This is. I know that's in kind of central. This is December, I believe, twentieth, if I'm not mistaken, okay, 1862. I, I think this battle. I think. Parker's Crossroads, like the 31st I think you're of right. December. So I just great battlefield to... out there too. Yeah, that's why I'm like that's the only reason I'm bringing it up because <laughs> I've seen it. So um, I figure that's happening at the same time. Yeah. So this so this this kind of puts a big thump into uh, Grant's plans because yeah. now his supply <clears throat> depot in his rear has been compromised. Grant has to sidestep and basically go all the way back to Grand Junction, Tennessee. Meanwhile, Sherman is still steaming down the Mississippi River. So this absolutely frees up Pemberton. Pemberton is going to first send Stephen Dill Lee with a uh, with his provisional brigade from Fort Pemberton on the Alabusha River, and he's going to send them down to Vicksburg, Mississippi, to help relieve the garrison down there. Now, during this during this time, there's more troops that are being sent. Pemberton will come with them to the city of Vicksburg to help relieve uh, to relieve that. Now, one moment. Yeah, the Holly Springs raid was December twentieth. By okay. the way. Um, but at this moment, you still have Sherman who's still steaming down south the Mississippi, the Mississippi River. Yeah. So Sherman will actually start to curve around what was referred to as Millican's Bend right on December uh, 24th, 1862. So this is Christmas Eve. And that same night, the Confederate officers in town are having a Christmas Eve ball in the Balfour House, which still does stand today. And there was a, uh, a Confederate soldier who witnessed these these uh, steamboats going down or oh, curving no. across the Millican's Bend. So he, he relays this information. I forgot the name of the soldier, but he'll knock on the door of the Balfour House, and he basically warns the officers of what's going on. And uh, Martin Luther Smith tells his men that, you know, the city, majority of the uh, uh, civilian populace should evacuate, uh, and then the rest of our garrison here should be prepared for a battle. So that's, this is in Vicksburg. This is in this is in okay. right in downtown Vicksburg. This is actually just a few blocks away from where Pemberton's headquarters would be later on. During so the is Sherman siege. making good time. Sherman's making good time okay. right now, and that will actually get into a, what I'm okay. about to mention next. So Sherman will uh, land at Johnson's plantation right at right where the Chickasaw Bayou spurs off of the Yazoo River. So real quickly, let me talk a little bit more about the battlefield terrain. So from the uh, remember. The Chickasaw Bayou battlefield is just north of the city of Vicksburg. Okay. So you have the Mississippi River, the Yazoo forks off, runs in a northeast direction, and then the Chickasaw Bayou will spur off and will run, for the most part, in uh, an eastern direction, and then it will curve sharply, almost at a 90-degree angle, and start running south. So it, when it's running para, or lateral, yeah, perpendicular to the Yazoo River, it's actually also running perpendicular to the Walnut Bluffs that I had mentioned earlier. Yeah. These bluffs that created that the, that the earthworks at Vicksburg were situated on, they they run in, in that same direction as the Yazoo River. So the Chickasaw Bayou, it's basically kind of creating an H with two ends of that H being with one end of that H being the Yazoo River, the other end of that H being the Chickasaw Bluffs, and then the the uh, the, the the little center hash mark of the H that is the Chickasaw Bayou. But once it starts to reach the base of the Walnut Bluffs. It's going to sh sharply curve south and will start running in a southern direction parallel to the Walnut Bluffs. Does that make a little bit of sense? It does. Okay. We'll, we'll put maps up too. <laughs> yeah. A lot of rivers moving. Yeah. So in short, this bayou runs perpendicular to the Walnut Bluffs where the Confederate line will be. And then right when it reaches the base of that bluffs, it's going to curve and start running south parallel to the Walnut Bluffs. Okay. So north of the Chickasaw Bayou, there was Blake's Levee and a small little waterway known as Thompson's Lake. That's going to be one avenue of invasion. The second avenue of invasion is going to be right in the center, and it's going to be on a small dirt road that basically parallels the Chickasaw Bayou, and then it will cross over the bayou right when it turns, which is at a corduroy bridge. A corduroy bridge is basically a fallen down timber that you use to stack together and make a bridge. Um... And so there's that, and then south 
of that position, there's going to be another little dirt road, and that's going to run right by the Vicksburg racetrack uh, and by Alligator Lake as well. But uh, if you follow where the, the Chickasaw Bayou runs parallel in between the middle and the south position, which is in between the dirt road by the Chickasaw Bayou and that dirt road by the racetrack, there is a shallow sandy area of the bayou that is referred to in some accounts as the sand spit. And just on the eastern side of the bayou from this part of, of, of the battlefields, it's going to be the Confederate side of the bayou, there's going to be a Native American mound. And that's going to become another pretty formidable battlefield position. So when Sherman lands at, uh, uh, at Johnson's plantation, in fact, some of the men uh, of the Federal Army, they believe they're landing at Jefferson Davis's plantation because Davis had a <laughs> plantation not too far away from Vicksburg. So when they're landing there, a lot of the men are kind of getting that hype up. They're landing at President Davis's uh, a plantation. And it's not. This is the Johnson plantation. <laughs> But when Sherman lands there, he quickly realizes he's on a time uh, he's on a timer to make this advance because he can see the water lines on the trees around him. He knows the water is going to start rising soon. And if the water starts rising, then that will make that whole area of the battlefield into much swampier area than it already was. This is a stupid question. Yes. Why is the water rising? Tides or is this like the time of year? I think it's the time of year. Okay. Studied, just, studied Civil War history, not geology. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I'm like, are the ice caps melting? Like, what's happening here? So, okay, so we'll, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so like I had mentioned, Sherman knows that those water, when he sees those water lines, he knows the water is probably going to start rising, and if it gets near that location, he's not going to be able to send his men into this part of the field. So he is on a time crunch right now. Now, the Confederate line during this battle is basically running on those Chickasaw Bluffs. And if you're ever standing at the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield area or where the fight happened at, look at those bluffs and you'll see a big obelisk to the north, northeast. And that is going to be the U.S. Navy monument from the Vicksburg National Military Park. That monument actually becomes a great marker for Chickasaw Bayou because that's roughly where the Confederate right is going to end up. So it gives you a good idea of how long their line is stretched out on those Chickasaw Bluffs. And by the way, those bluffs aren't just some small rise. I'm sure Elijah can mention because he's seen them himself. They basically turn and they steep. sharply go yeah. right up there, and they become a perfect artillery platform for the Confederate artillerist. And uh, by the way, like I mentioned earlier, if you're standing at the Fort Hill tour stop at the Vicksburg Nil the National Military Park, look north. That right past the uh, uh, the timber yard that you're seeing there, that is the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield. That gives you an idea just how close this is to the city of Vicksburg. So, like I'd mentioned, the Confederates they are made aware of this movement on Christmas Eve, 1862, and they are going to start to position on the Chickasaw Bayou or on the Chickasaw Bluffs, and then start sending some of some troops into the actual area that would become the battlefield. So for Sherman, he has four divisions here. And each of those divisions are going to have a different task. This is the only time of this podcast that I'm going to go through and mention the order of battle. Oh, man. Because <laughs> I will mention right now, there's a lot of Smiths. There's a lot of Morgans. And some of them get wounded. Some of them take over for some of the other ones. It gets very confusing here at this battle. Like I said, a lot so, of Smiths, a lot of Morgans. So he's got four divisions? Four divisions. So one of those divisions is under Brigadier General Andrew J. Smith. The next one is under Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith. The next one is George W. Morgan, and then the next one is Frederick Steele. But there's also some brigades within these divisions that, that, have, the same that, have, that have the last names as well. So it's, he basically has an entire army. Yeah. He, well, no, no, no. He has a corps. Yes. I think this yeah. is, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the 13th Corps. Okay. I might be wrong there. Uh, so but this is 30,000 or how many? Roughly 30,000 troops. That's nuts. That's yeah, a lot. That's a lot 62, of troops. 62, that's a lot of troops. Yes. Especially in the state of Mississippi, too. This that's isn't, nuts. This isn't, you don't think you know, about that many right troops outside there. Richmond. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited now. That's a lot. <laughs> so Sherman's men start landing on Johnson's plant or at Johnson's plantation on Christmas Day. And some of the first Confederate troops that are sent out to kind of oppose this landing are going to be soldiers of the 26th Louisiana Infantry, which includes my fourth great grandfather's company. They're going to exchange shots with these uh, uh, with with these ships as they start to curve in uh, into the Yazoo River, and then when the ship-based artillery start firing into the Confederate infantry, they fall back. They withdraw from the Johnson Plantation south 
uh, to another plantation which is adjacent to the Chickasaw Bayou, and that is the Ann Lake Plantation. So they'll fall back into a series of rifle pits that are uh, already have, already been have been dug in. It's probably crude rifle pits, so maybe not your super formidable ones, but they're right on the uh, the edge of the Ann Lake Plantation itself. And uh, when Sherman's there, remember I, I had said that he he realizes he's kind of on a time crunch to make this assault, but he also says, and this is a a, a pretty popular quote when you talk about this battle. He reportedly said that we will lose 5,000 men before we take the city of Vicksburg. We might as well lose them here. So bold, when bold strategy, Cotton. I was yeah. going to say, a lot of people today, they look back at Chickasaw Bayou, and it's one of those, what was Sherman thinking? Yeah. I mean, he's sending his men into a swampland. For, for Sherman's men, they're going to have to assault into these plantations that have rifle pits. And then after those plantations, they're going to have to assault through the bayou, which has swampy you know thick underbrush swampy swampy land and then after they cross the chickasaw bayou if which is going to be hotly contested they're then going to have to charge up the walnut bluffs and then on top of that there is a lot of abate around uh, on the uh, uh the confederate side of the chickasaw bayou so explain like, that for the listeners so like, that's like fallen down tree or a uh, uh, chopped down trees um basically anything that you can make to create an obstacle for the enemy infantry as they try to take your position. So, like I said, falling down timber, sharpened off, uh, stuff along those lines are a great example of abate. You reckon there's any alligators? What was that? In the swamps? No? Not that far I don't... I, there probably is alligators in that, <laughs> in that part of the this state. This is a fair question. That would be I crazy. I will say, I was at Alligator Lake. I did not see any alligators when I was over there, and that's right on the battlefield. So, if it's named Alligator Lake, I'm... There's got to be alligators yeah, in that area. Yeah, 160 year difference. There might be a little change. Well, there's in the also population. swamplands that are even more, north, uh, more uh, northeast than that in the state of Mississippi. So, and I don't know if alligators are running that far north, but if it's named Alligator Lake, it'd be kind good of good reason for yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would assume it's probably for a good reason. And if not, then then I'm sorely mistaken here. So, just to kind of describe the the landscape too. Yeah, the Confederates have the high ground entirely, more inland, and when the the Federals are deploying. The Federals' gunships, mm -hmm. the weapons they have on the ships, they can only cover kind of just the immediate front. The Confederates yes. still have the high ground. And then is the landscape itself, is that just marshy wetlands? Is it solid ground? It's basically marshy, flat wetlands oh, gosh. up until you hit the Chickasaw Bayou. And the Chickasaw Bayou is a pretty thick bayou itself. Yeah. And then, like I said, once you cross that bayou, you're going to have that Chickasaw Bluffs, also referred to as the Walnut Bluffs in some accounts. Yeah. And those are entirely imposing. Yeah. So and it's, it's also, just... it, I mean, it, there are, you have to remember that this is a really, you know, heavy underbrush area too. So Sherman can't really see too far ahead of him yeah. either. Or, or he can't send, you know, men. Scouts. Yeah, you and, can't send scouts yeah. that deep into the lines because they don't know where they're going either. So, Going back to Sherman's four corps, each of those are going to have a different task. The fir or four divisions, my apologies. The first division, which is under the command of Brigadier General Andrew J or Andrew Jackson, Whiskey Smith, that's his nickname. Which Cheers. I think that's a great, you know, really appropriate for what we're doing here. Um, he has two brigades, and they're going to try and make movement north of the battlefield at Milliken's Bend. And then once that movement, it kind of doesn't go right for them, they're going to then try and take the southern end of the battlefield by the Vicksburg racetrack. The second division is under the command of Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith. He has two brigades. They're going to try and advance through the dirt road, which runs for the most part parallel to the Chickasaw Bayou, then crosses over it when the bayou turns. And then he is going to try and break off or he'll eventually break off, and he will make it a diversionary attack at the Sand Spit. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that attack played and uh, came into play. Um, the third division is the largest division in Sherman's army. This is Brigadier General George W. Morgan. He's got three brigades and a battalion of artillery. Their goal is to advance down the dirt road adjacent to the bayou, the same one that Morgan L. Smith's uh, division are advancing down. But as Morgan L. Smith's men take a make a diversionary attack. George W. Morgan's division are going to basically be the main assault. They're going to be the hammering blow that will try to cross the Corduroy Bridge right where the Chickasaw Bayou turns south. Um, and then the last division, the 4th Division, is under the command of Brigadier General Frederick Steele. They are going to try and advance on the northern side of the battlefield using Blake's Levee. So that kind of gives you an idea of 
where each of those units or each of those divisions will be advancing during that battle. So like I mentioned earlier, opening shots happen on Christmas Day. The Confederates will fall back from Johnson's plantation to the Ann Lake plantation site. And the 26th Louisiana will take up these rifle pits alongside the 1st Mississippi Light Artillery. They will end up being relieved by uh, the 17th Louisiana, um, another Mississippi unit. I've forgotten the number right there. And uh, eventually, the, the, as the Union start driving using the Corduroy Bridge, in, or the, uh, the dirt road on the Chickasaw Bayou, they start driving into the battlefield. These units, the 26th Louisiana, 1st Mississippi Light Artillery, 17th Louisiana, they're basically going to harass those front lines of Sherman's men. And the spearhead of Sherman's advance is going to come under uh, gen- uh, 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 is going to come from Colonel DeCourcy's brigade. DeCourcy was a Midwesterner. He had uh, Kentucky units, Ohio units within his command. And they, like I said, they're going to be kind of the tip of the spear as Sherman is advancing down the Chickasaw Bayou or down the dirt road next to the Chickasaw Bayou. So on December 28th, uh, the, or De- yeah, December 28th, the Confederates will fall back from those rifle pits at the Ann Lake Plantation site. And it's a very heated uh, uh, skirmishing that are happening during these movements. They'll fall back from the Ann Lake Plantation site back across the Chickasaw Bayou, and they will position themselves in a series of rifle pits, which are right on the base of the Chickasaw Bluff. So it's kind of like on a little shelf that kind of jumps out at the edge or at the bottom of the Chickasaw Bluffs. Was there any fears or did they have protection behind them with having the bayou to their back? They, the big protection coming from their rear is going to be the Confederate artillery. And that's always on the bluffs. That's on the bluffs. The entire time. Okay. And they have, like I said, a perfect view shed of this battlefield. Okay. So, so there was no concern being in front of the obstacles that were already behind them, including the fallen trees and everything like that. No, um, and as uh, as these troops are kind of withdrawing from this part of the battlefield, they're being relieved by other units. So okay. it's 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 tactical. Yeah. Uh, 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 Stephen Dilley and John C. Pemberton and um, uh, Martin Luther Smith, they're they're doing this methodically. Okay, cool. So eventually, like I said, the Confederates are going to fall back. They'll withdraw to these rifle pits, which are on the base of the Walnut Bluffs. They are on the Confederate side of the Chickasaw Bayou. So on December 28th, Sherman is going to launch his first major assault on the Chickasaw Bayou. They're going to push, uh, they're going to officially push back the last straggling units of the Confederates across the bayou. And then the next day, uh, by the, uh, that later that night, Sherman will actually set up his headquarters in the Ann Lake Plantation House itself. So that's right in there in the middle of the battlefield. And then he is planning for a massive assault on December 29th, that next day. So going back to those four divisions that I mentioned earlier, uh, Andrew J. Smith's men at Milliken's Bend, they kind of get forced out of that position. They'll then try to take this uh, for the main assault on December 29th. They're going to assault on the southern end of the battlefield by the Vicksburg racetrack, and they'll run into some thick abate. They're checked at that part of the battlefield. No major fighting or no real heavy fighting happens down there. And then north of the battlefield, Frederick Steele's division on Blake's Levee, they'll, uh, r- they'll run into um, a number of, conf- uh, of Mississippi and Louisiana units, and they'll be checked back. Uh, some, some skirmishing, not nearly as heated at what's happening over the Chickasaw Bayou in the middle of the battlefield, though. So the main assault is going to come from two brigades. That's going to be Thayer's Brigade and DeCourcy, or three brigades, Thayer's Brigade, DeCourcy's Brigade, and Blair's Brigade. The Corsi's brigade are going to try and make a diversionary assault over that sand spit that I was mentioning earlier. So remember the Chickasaw Bayou, it runs towards the, the Chickasaw Bluffs, then will curve south and will run parallel to the bluffs. Right where it's running parallel, there's that sandbar area. It's a shallow, shallow area. And then right on the Confederate side of, that, uh, of the bayou there, there is that Native American mound that I had mentioned. And they'll set up artillery on that mound. Uh, that'll be a uh, that'll be a pretty significant location there. Do they know what it is at the time, or are they just like it's I, a hill? It's referred to as the Indian Mound okay, in, in in accounts. So I'm assuming they know that the the history of the okay. of the site. And I'm not sure. Uh, uh, as long as they're what, picking what, it up, I guess. Yeah, I'm not. I'm <laughs> not sure which people's uh, actually made the Native American yeah. mound that's out there. I'm not sure if that's like Natchez or the Chickasaw natives, but. Uh, 
probably one of those. Or maybe the Choctaw. Yeah. There's there's a lot in that region. Are, of the they, are there a lot of those mounds around there still? There's a lot in the Mississippi area. Like if you drive the Natchez Trace, you'll go through. You'll go by a number of those Native American mounds, or even through the Mississippi Delta, you'll see some in there as well. Uh, I've had the honor, or I've had the privilege of living in Connecticut, Mississippi, Maryland. I work here in Virginia. And I've never seen Native American mounds like that. They actually have really great examples at the Shiloh National Military Park. Wow. Like some of the best examples I've ever seen were at Shiloh National Military Park. So wow. if you ever go in there, definitely check that out while you're at the battlefield. So they're putting artillery on top. Yes, of they're putting artillery on that at Chickasaw Bayou. And Thayer's Brigade is going to be the ones that make this diversionary assault across the, the sand spit. So what they're hoping is that the Confederates start focusing on that crossing there, and that will weaken up the Confederates that are opposing the Corduroy Bridge, which is right north of that position where the Chickasaw Bayou curves south. Remember, where it curves is going to be where that bridge site was, and that's going to be the real focal point of this battlefield. So as Thayer's men are making that diversionary assault across the sand spit south of the Corduroy Bridge, you're going to have de Corsi's brigade are going to try an assault across the Corduroy Bridge and then on the other side of the Chickasaw Bayou, you're going to have Blair's uh, Brigade, and they're going to try to assault the same area. Uh, so de Corsi and Blair's Brigade are going to basically converge onto the same area of the battlefield. So this diversionary assault does not work out well for Sherman. Thayer's men are going to be bogged down in that sand spit, uh, particularly the Missouri unit that's out there. I'm thinking it's the 6th Missouri Infantry. Maybe. I can't confirm. <laughs> um, they're going to uh, suffer heavy, heavy casualties as they assault the uh, the sand spit right opposite from where the uh, Native American mound was. Six Missouri. Six right. Missouri. There we go. And then DeCourcy and Blair's Brigade are going to be the ones that actually do breach across the Chickasaw Bayou. So they will make it across the bayou. Partic this is mostly DeCourcy's Brigade. There are portions of Blair's Brigade, but I'm thinking this is mostly... To Corsi's men who funnel across that corduroy bridge, redeploy on the Confederate side of the bayou, and they're going to make numerous assaults onto the uh, the Confederate earthwork or the Confederate rifle pits and onto the Chickasaw Bluffs. Each of these advances is soundly checked. The furthest advance for any Union troops at the Chickasaw Bayou battlefield is going to come from the 16th Ohio Infantry, and they will charge deep up the uh, the Chickasaw Bluffs, but then. They're going to be resoundingly checked and sent back across the Chickasaw Bayou. So when the Confederate or when the uh, Confederates force back the Union uh, uh, from from this charge, and this is going to be a all day event. This is there's not just one grand assault. There's more of numerous smaller assaults that kind of play into this whole battle right here, and that's going to be kind of what p keeps on hammering and driving to Corsi's men across the Bayou and into the Chickasaw Bluffs. But once they're checked back and sent across the, uh, to the other side of the Chickasaw Bayou again, they are now at the hands of the Confederate infantry who then launch a counterattack. Mm. And they're going to launch this counterattack. Um, primarily, it's going to come from the 17th and the 26th Louisiana infantry. So the Pelican State pretty well represented right here. And we, uh, for, for when I was studying this battle, I was going back to the account of uh, Colonel Winchester Hall, who is the commanding officer of the uh, uh of, of the 26th louisiana infantry and he has a great account of this part of the battle he'll mention that lee rides uh stephen dilly rides at the 26 he sends his men on this counter charge and as they cross the chickasaw bayou some of the men of the 26th louisiana they're they're bayoneting some of the the, the straggling union soldiers and winchester hall he's uh he's trying to kind of get control or, you know get, gain control of his men so he'll actually start riding up and down the lines and he'll start smacking his men in their behind with the flat end of his saber <laughs> and in fact if you want to see that saber today it is out on display at confederate memorial hall in new orleans louisiana so definitely cool. worth mentioning there and i also will mention here while i'm on the topic of the 26th louisiana infantry there is a company captain by the name of louis guillon who was an Ole Miss alumni as well. So you can't have me on this podcast without me mentioning something <laughs> Ole Miss Civil War related. That's this episode's. And uh, like I said, uh, uh, Winchester Hall, he'll ride up and down the line. He'll smack some of the men on the behind with the flat end of that saber, kind of restructure his men out there. And he'll actually cock his pistol and he'll tell him that I'll fire on any man who fires on any of these straggling Union soldiers from here on out. So that's really where the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou kind of ends 
Sherman's going to, he'll make another demonstration a few days later at Milliken's Bend again. But at this point, Sherman's just going to, he'll pack up. He's going to head back to Memphis after this campaign. And once again, this is important for a number of reasons because 1862, the Confederates checked the Union advance at Fredericksburg. They checked the Union advance in Middle Tennessee. And then here they checked it at Vicksburg. So 1862 really does end on a positive note for the Confederates, especially here in Mississippi, where they had string of Union victory, Union victory, Union victory. Now you finally had that Confederate victory that for the time, saved the city of Vicksburg. What was Grant's response to Sherman pulling out? Uh, I do not have his official report written down anywhere or or anything like that. I probably should have gotten that. But I mean, like, just so I don't know, Sheridan. Did I say Sheridan, too? No, I said Sherman. We'll we'll, we'll say you said Sherman. Okay. For the record. Uh, For the record. Um, (laughs) I mean, how does this affect him in his career. For then. Sherman, yeah. this is going to be a bit, this is going to be something that affects the rest of his career. This is actually kind of what forms the William T. Sherman that we will know from the Civil War. So what? how did the Confederates win this battle? Going back to the big picture, it was the cavalry operations of Nathan Bedford Forrest and Earl Van Dorn out in northern Mississippi and western Tennessee that freed, uh, that, that freed up Pemberton to reinforce the Vicksburg garrison. So that's on Sherman's mind the rest of the war. And just, uh, just just a little bit later at the Meridian campaign, he's going to really start his scorched earth campaigns, the total warfare that we'll see in uh, in Mississippi, we'll see it in Georgia, we'll see it right here in the Shenandoah Valley as well. And that uh, the reason why he does that is because he is trying to stop the civilian populace from helping out those cal- or those cavaliers or those bushwhackers. Um, so he's basically uh, from here on out when he destroys property. It's for the most part, he has it on the mind that he remembers what happened at Chickasaw Bayou. He remembered those cavalry operations, and they were being supported by the Confederate populace in the state of Mississippi. That is what led to his defeat at Chickasaw Bayou. I'll also kind of jump in and say that it was the terrain that was yeah. there. That that's a big reason why he lost as well. But for the camp or for the career of William Tecumseh Sherman. This battle, which, like I had said in the beginning, it's widely overlooked in many narratives of the war and even many narratives of the movements for Vicksburg. You kind of see this one kind of get left out because not part of those initial movements in 1863 that bring Grant to the city. But this battle is going to have massive implications for the rest of the war for uh, uh, because this is where you see the, the plan of Scorched Earth really come to live in William Tecumseh Sherman's mind. And I think us as Civil War historians, we know that he's one of those figures that is really well tied to the Scorched Earth sure. uh, campaign. So it will affect, you know, at the end, at the end of 1862, becoming a massive Confederate victory, but it's also going to affect the rest of the career of William Tecumseh Sherman. And then for the meantime, this little battle, it had saved the city of Vicksburg uh, just less than another uh, than a year later. City on July fourth, eighteen sixty three, the city of Vicksburg, including my fourth great grandfather, he's going to be surrendered in the Army of Mississippi at that uh, in the Vicksburg garrison. The city of Vicksburg falls. So this little battle saved it for a short period of time, but less than a year later, it, it, Vicksburg is no more. It's in firm firm Union hands. So that is the importance of the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. That was for the most part some of those troop movements as well. Uh, And yeah, I I hope everybody enjoyed it today. Like I said, if you guys are ever planning to go down to the Vicksburg National Military Park, which I 100% will tell everybody, if you're a Civil War historian, if you've never seen the sites in Mississippi, then make it a trip because you haven't seen Civil War sites until you've really been out there. Um, And if you go to Vicksburg, make a trip to go see Chickasaw Bayou. It's right there basically in the town. And although they don't have much signs and interpretation up right now, that might change in the future. There still is that terrain where you can get a great idea of the imposing bayou, those Chickasaw Bluffs, and then you can still see the Native American Mount. It's still out there as well. So there's a lot of stuff to see at this battlefield if you take the time to go out there. I definitely recommend if anyone's going to plan a trip to the uh, Chickasaw Bayou battlefield, pick up a copy of the story of the 26th Louisiana Infantry written by Winchester Hall. You can find transcriptions of that online. Or pick up the Blue and Gray magazine a copy written by Terrence Winchell on the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. It includes the best collection of maps I've ever seen on that battle. And then on top of that, it has a perfect explanation of the importance and the troop movements. And if you want even further reading, uh, look up the uh, 
Early Movements of Vicksburg by Timothy B. Smith, which is the opening book of his Vicksburg anthology. But that book is basically about the Central Mississippi Railroad campaign, and it culminates at the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. And don't forget to go to YouTube and look up Frito History. That's true. The first, first episode of Frito History and uh, the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. For- and most importantly to our guests, if you haven't yet, become a member of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District. What, what they're doing here in, in, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia is absolutely amazing. The, the amount of preservation efforts that are currently underway and if you guys like Civil War preservation, you like hearing about what's actively happening with Civil War preservation, then look no further than joining as a member of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield National Historic District. I guarantee you, you will, you will find worth in it. Yeah, well, Mike did the pitch for me, so thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming on, Mike. This is We know we've been wanting to do this one for a while, and uh, your 11th Mississippi episode did really, really good. People were interested in that, so hopefully folks are interested in Chickasaw Bayou. I'm glad we can cover an area of the really true Western Western theater and uh, something you're really passionate about and knowledgeable with. So uh, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, we'll, we'll enjoy sipping on this Penelope as well. Oh, some Indeed. good stuff, for sure. Yeah, Creamy. For good this time of year. So go out and grab yourself a <laughs> bottle, and uh, don't forget to like and, uh, and follow and subscribe. Do whatever you need to do. Share with your friends. Give us five stars, and we'll, uh, we'll catch you on the next one.